Hi everyone, this is uh, João, also known as Polygon Messworks. And this is Rick with uh, White Light Media and Revelation Skirmish. And this is the Max and Miniatures podcast, where we talk about everything related to tabletop gaming and designing tabletop games. So in this uh, week's episode, we're going to be tackling a series of questions uh, that... Uh, our fans and users on the on the internet uh, asked us to tackle specifically about designing max everything that goes into making max for a game and the kinds of decisions that we take both as game designers and as mac lovers but first rick uh, how's how's it going uh, what have you been uh, working on um i everything's going good i'm um working on a, a promotion for the blood wolves sub sub faction <laughs> and um that's moving forward a little bit slower than i wanted but it's it's moving forward we also have several models um in process uh along with an illustration and uh some new conversations with a couple of other artists so it's it's uh the business management side of things have gotten very busy right and and you've also just recently added some new uh, drones and new stls on the store right yep yeah and i have to catch up my store to where we are with the stl so um there is no shortage of work right still missing the orcas i'm i'm trying i'll <laughs> be there soon yeah people have been demanding that um on my part, uh, it's it's been business as, also as usual. Um, I'm I'm uh, I have two artists working on concepts for Black Star right now, um, and I've been getting uh, their art in. And today is actually one of them is gonna going to send me like a, a big update. I'm really looking forward to that um, concerning like the dual cockpit Mac, and I'm also trying to finalize the. The Dragon Force release for Patreon, which should have been done already, but it's it's been like a lot of stuff to handle. Like I, I said in the last episode, I've gotten since I started the Discord server, uh, I've gotten so so much feedback on Black Star and so many ideas that it's it's the kind of stuff that you really have to tackle uh, right right then. So I've just been. Writing, rewriting, uh, testing rules, making up rules, uh, modifying stuff uh, in addition to trying to work on the 3D stuff for the Patreon, trying to manage the artists working for me at the moment. So it's a lot of, of stuff going on a at once uh, while I'm also like planning how the best ways to, to increase basically my internet presence. In terms of website, uh, what can I do to to increase like the visibility for the game? Yeah, and that's that's a lot of stuff. Yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, so I, I guess we can uh, dive in right now. Um, people uh, asked us to talk about design principles for Max, uh, like the Max themselves. How how do we envision? Um, the max working when we are designing them, how we select features for for the max, um, and even both lore wise and in terms of of rules, like how how do we give them set stats for gameplay? What types of flavors do we give the max and in specific factions and why? Um, so um, tackling that, how what do you feel about that, Rick? It's a it's a very interesting topic because every developer is going to come at it from a different perspective. They have different rules or guidelines or um, processes so that the the unit comes out you know in the direction that they want and it, it and it is vastly different between the different um, game system. Um, whether the, you know it focuses mostly on lore or mostly focuses on just rule of cool or just whatever they use as their uh, beacon that kind of guides the process. Right. Um, yeah, from my part, Blackstar is, is kind of set up a, a bit differently. Um, 
obviously I, I go into the whole thing like where I have specific factions and and I want each specific faction to have its own flavor its own look right um, but Black Star is being not only uh, focusing on being a mech tournament and and the uh, game modes are really low on on the quantity of units like it's one one versus one mech or two v two or a grand melee of the amount of players that want to participate um, and um, it's supposed to be a celebration of mechs right so I'm 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 really trying to to give each faction. Uh, to, to be a sort of representative of a type of mecha that has been in fiction, right? Mm -hmm. um, which means, uh, from, from the starting point that I'm going in, uh, I sort of already know, okay, this is like a, a front mission style mech. This is, a, a, this other faction has an armored core style mech. This other faction has a battle tech style mech. So since that is already the starting point, I already have a pretty good idea of what I want to do which e with each of the mechs and each of the factions because I have, uh, I have basically like a, a, a baseline to draw from which is like the inspirations for them. Yeah, and that's... Um, I think with... <clears throat> With Blackstar, you're going to have an interesting opportunity because the 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 technology doesn't have to necessarily match. Like it, it'll it'll jump in a different way. Obviously, visually, it'll be very distinct, very 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 distinct. Um, and I think fans of these different universes or or fans of that sort of style of universe, not not copying, but you know, being inspired by. Yeah, I think will have more to choose from than versus most games where you have um, kind of one one primary style. Yeah, I mean, if you take, for example, uh, Battletech into account, right? right. If you're playing a, a Steiner Force, it's mostly like playing a, a Combined Force or a Comstar Force. Um, they have a few like specific technologies there that that might create a little bit of difference like uh, improved c3 while the steiner forces tend to be heavier and and like ghost rifles and stuff like that but it's all max and and most of the max play play basically the same right here black star will be a game where, where you will feel really feel the symmetries between the different types of mecha philosophies and that's one of the things that uh, that really interested me going into designing the game, but at the same time, obviously, it creates uh, game design challenges because the symmetry. That there's a reason a lot of those old uh, real-time strategy PC games ha had the factions basically be mirrors uh, with different skins, because it's much easier to design something if if both factions have the same capabilities. Right. And that's, I think, visually important. And um, like with Revelations, my, you know, as opposed to like an example like Battletech, where everything feels, I'm not going to say they all feel the same, because fans of Battletech are going to say, no, they're very different depending on certain totem mechs or certain other elements. But by and large, as far as an outsider perspective, looking into Battletech, they do feel samey. That doesn't, that's not a bad thing. No, no. At all, no. because visually that was their decision. That's not a bad thing. That's just what they picked. You look at games like Warhammer 40K, and there is a, um, not counting if you play any of the human, you know, you could say, well, all the Marines look very similar. Yeah, right, because they use the same base body and then they add cosmetics. And then, but when you look at Space Marines, Tyranids, Tau, there's a very distinct flavors. They are not the same. Yeah. Um, so with Revelations, I kind of went a little bit more with the um, Warhammer sort of application to my forces, where I was I wanted it to be that if someone sat down and they played Core Republic, that the other player would recognize what faction they are pretty quickly. If they played Union of Stars, if they played any of the other factions, they'd be able to say, okay, I, I, I see it. Now, Mercenaries mixes everybody, um, but by and large... 
the different units, even tanks and infantry, don't cross the main factions. So uh, I, I just wanted it to feel um, like there's more variation visually. So what we're trying to do, and that, and that sometimes brings challenges yeah. to the design process because you're like, okay, we're designing a new Republic Mac, and then someone um, may want to be like, oh, what about th this sort of style for a new one? It's like, well, that's not a bad style at all. It's just now it's guiding us away from what is already pre-established. And there has to be a reason for why you did that. If your primary, whatever faction you're working on, if it's if it's blocky or if it's mostly smooth or rounded or whatever, and then all of a sudden you have something that's the opposite, well, why would they pick something opposite? Um, and it's just a different type of philosophy that's added. I, I, um, I like doing it the way that I chose so that it's visually easier for players, but there's not anything that says any decision is right or wrong. It's just how you want it to apply your universe. And, you know, there's, um, I could go a lot deeper with it, but I mean, I, that the, the overall, that's sort of the, the, the beginning of the thought process. Yeah. Um, I have to say that the more I got into Warhammer in the past, like 10 years or so, the, the more I enjoyed the fact that each faction really has its own flavor. Um, Coming from a background of playing Battletech for, for like 25 years, um, I did find that uh, refreshing. Um, Battletech has been on a journey where they, they have been trying to make each faction have its own specific flavor more and more, even though obviously there is, a, like you said, a sameness to Battletech, and that's, that's not actually a negative quality, but... There is a sameness where, where at a certain point almost, they almost played the same. And, and they have been trying to also visually change the mechs. Like the wolf mechs now look more wolfish. The, the, the Dracondis combined mechs now, now look more Japanese, you know, stuff like that. And that originally comes from the Clicks game, the MechWarrior Dark Age game from 20 years ago, where they actually started doing that. They, mm -hmm. they, they did those Jade Falcon mech designs where they had wings and they had beaks and talons and stuff like that. Um, and I, I I do enjoy that approach and the approach that you are taking more than, than those games and universes where everything kind of looks the same. Um, of course, you, you see in a lot of fiction, here in the real, real world, you have like just look at cars you have like a billion different designs and even in some the same brands you ha you can find a few different design aesthetics sometimes as fiction makers and as game makers we have to to make sure that our our factions are recognizable so we try to give them a unified aesthetic that might not be the most realistic thing but but it uh, it works in terms of game recognition, which right, is yeah. what you were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, it's one thing for you know as as a developer, you're kind you're trying to walk a line of <clears throat> what is, and it depends. Some developers probably do not can go this way. I go with what is a, a semi realistic way of doing things. Um, we're getting to the point now where we have enough mechs and revelations and tanks and infantry, and it starts getting to a point of, okay, this is the baseline of technology. Um, different nations will have a different access to different types of weapons, more, more or less, and that's also a decision for gameplay, and it's also a decision for visual distinctness. Um, so you, you, But at the same time, you do run out of weapons at some point when you've designed <laughs> enough units in the game, you have, you'll start seeing units that have basically the same combination. So then what you do is you start saying, okay, but this tank for a different nation, even though it has basically the same loadout as this other nation, we can do keywords. We can do um, different stat values for the weapons, whether that's ranges or damage value. Um, and that way you can add a flavor without trying to come up with 80 million different types of weapons because at some point you know it, it, your universe figured out what works you right know, they, they they know granted certain um 
energy output for lasers will be different possibly between nations or different mech speeds, you know, because one nation has better access to, to um, improved engines, you know, or, or generators, whatever that you use for your, your power source. But at the same time, at some point, they've kind of reached a level of, okay, this is what works. We found that this work, you know, so you don't have anyone totally reinventing the wheel. And um, you then, as the developer, start trying to, okay, but what makes this loadout different on this design? And we're actually running into that. We're working on the uh, fourth main faction for Revelations called the Faust Union. And they um, are a very ballistic or missile heavy nation. They're not as advanced as some of the others, so they don't have access to plasma weapons really at all. They don't have too many laser weapons because they're um, in universe more expensive. So they uh, they just don't put them out as often in designs. So we ended up running into a design that I wanted. I wanted the Faust Union to have a mech that was basically very. Uh, it was kind of like their answer to the Sierra, which is our main war mech. It's our kind of our visual flagship. And I was like, okay, so that they they see the Republic has the Sierra, and they're like, well, we can do one better. So you know, <laughs> it's going to have a similar loadout. But then um, bouncing back and forth between the concept artists on this one, and we're trying to, you know, we don't want it to be identical visually, obviously, but we're trying to. Um, make it feel distinct even though it's going to have a similar loadout um and my concept artist wants to try to do things a little different but we'll we'll see how it ends up being with the uh, variants and such but you know i started to realize you know, we're kind of um we're at the point where we have to m make sure that stat changes are what's what's different because a mech with a cannon missile launchers and a machine gun to deal with infantry is kind of a standard way of doing things in revelations right it's like a jack of all trades sort of right and um kind of speaking to um the design uh for max one of the approaches that i have is that all war max just about all it's almost like a hundred percent rule for me is that max have to have some sort of answer for infantry because, you know, in the real world, we know that a tank can be super deadly. And depending on the nation and what the level of the enemy has to fight that tank, you know, what sort of weaponry they have access to, the tank is either near indestructible or it's super vulnerable. So if you say you have two relatively level armies, they're going to be pretty good at taking out a tank or disabling it or, um, you know, they have with it. They have and, basically anti-armor doctrines. Basically. Right, exactly. Yes. And so with War Max, it's going to be the same thing. These people, you know, if you have relatively even forces against each other, they're going to know how to deal with your Max. You're going to know how to deal with theirs. So infantry are going to be a problem for Max, especially if you're more of a dense urban environment or, or whatnot. So my War Max have to have at least one sort of anti infantry thing to just discourage infantry from getting near them. So in the game, you know, a lot of them either have some sort of light laser weapon that's a repeater or something that has a lot of dice to be able to throw, but it doesn't do a lot of damage, or it'll have some sort of machine gun or minigun to kind of do the exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and look at how that differs, for example, from, from the approach I'm taking on, on Black Star, because it's a mech on mech tournament, right? So I don't have any concern about having anti-infantry weapons in there. Right, and I don't have any concern about having like artillery weapons in there because that 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 just won't happen. The, the mechs are fighting in in a smallish arena, so just from the fact that you are, that you developed a combined arms army game, and I'm developing a mech only, like a, a almost sports style game, the loadout and, and the philosophies behind the designs will have to be very different. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's just one example of, of a, approaching mech designs uh, depending on exactly what you want your game to be because uh, it, it would be useless to, to have like a, 
an anti-personnel mech uh, like outfitted like that when, when it's going into a mech tournament. Well, yeah, it would, it would be, <laughs> it wouldn't have very good results. At, at the same time, and you see this uh, in, in many games, it, it also doesn't make sense to be like, um, this, uh, this is a combined arms game and I have infantry and I have battle armors and, and all sorts of stuff, but my mech only has like anti-mech missiles or something. It, c clearly there's something that doesn't that isn't working there and and i see that a lot when especially when people uh configure their their units like oh that this, this weapon is super overpowered so i'm uh, i'm just going to do a configuration based on this yeah but you're ignoring everything else that is on the battlefield mm -hmm. uh, and i'm also at fault for that because i used to play battletech sort of that way you know i never I think most yeah. of us do if we start to customize <laughs> at some point we gotta cross that yeah and uh, for example you you were mentioning in revelations the mercenaries faction has access to all sorts of technology from from core republic and the union of stars and and orca the other faction and the for the Faust union right um and and that uh, i guess that's why mercenaries tend to be so popular in in most games because they have access to pretty much an assortment of, of what all the other factions have. At least I know in, in Battletech, I used to like, all, always, uh, I, I used to like being mercenaries because I could just pick uh, this mech and this mech and this mech where they usually would be different factions. I can just say, oh, they, they salvaged the mech somewhere. So now this mercenary unit has even clan mechs. You know, I always found a way to have a, a, a Warhawk in there because it's my favorite mech, but it's a clan mech. So mm -hmm. they just salvaged it during the invasion or something. No. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. even about the clan weapons. Yeah, and it then you have a development issue where you have to make sure that the mercenary forces are balanced. Right. Um, so I just do like a basically a, a, an additional point cost um, that's just built into their to their points when you build your list and that way they kind of have, I call it a mercenary tax. So that way they don't break the game because they do have access to so many things and it, it kind of keeps them uh, relatively in check. And then I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to explore more and more the idea of um, basically like a faction perk. So if you take, um, all forces from this faction, you get a, a, a bonus for like Orca because it has multiple sub factions within it. Right. Um, so that way, because uh, Orca works where they have multiple sub nations that all are part of a larger nation that kind of basically has a, a um, an alliance pact. So if someone else gets attacked, we all go and help that one. Um, like NATO, basically. Basically, yeah. And because there are much smaller nations against some of the larger. Yeah. Um, m more militarily strong nations, so they will kind of rush to the other ones if if they if they can. But they, um, if someone wants to play like one of the sub nations, because we're trying to develop enough units in their roster to be able to play just them, if you want, there needs to be an incentive um, to pick them. I guess other than just visually, because I like them. Like I'm trying to make it like okay, if you get all of your forces are this sub faction they'll have a better cohesion together in game than if they're mixed um and i just think that's more of a fun way to kind of encourage um i guess lore participation <laughs> right and and how do you handle for example inside the 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 main orca like the main orca group right they have to have a specific uh, aesthetic, they have to have a specific flavor, but then how, how as a game designer, how do you handle each sub-faction having its own flavor, um, not just from, do you just give them, like you were saying, a few faction-specific abilities, or... Or are you actually changing the loadouts of the max, or maybe the max looks slightly different, even though they are the same aesthetic? How do you handle that? How do you design for that? So with uh, Orca, as I was mentioning, the sub nations, some of them are vastly different than the others. So you have Ethril, and Ethril is basically space knights. So they 
are much higher tech than almost every other nation out there, but they're much smaller. So they're going to be not the units, but the, the number of planets. Um, so what I'm doing with them is they're very advanced, but they're much more expensive. You look at Haven, who's basically um, they're a lower tech nation that kind of cobbles together their stuff. So their stuff is a much lower tech. So they're boxier, um, more simple designs, not to where it's it's it still fits Revelation's overall visual aesthetic. But they're there. You can tell there's a difference. There's a step down. Right. Um, and some people actually really like their style. So it's it's working. But um, I have two other sub nations within that. And then they also, as I'm getting ready to, they're going to have access to a number of mercenary forces because they, they use mercenaries a lot to kind of supplement everything else that they're doing. Um, so I was just thinking, well, how am I going to make it so that they have access to mercenaries? And then they don't end up becoming a stronger nation because they have mercenaries. Then they have their own sub factions mixed in. So they have better point costs than if you only played mercenaries. So I'm looking at basically only allowing them access to the weaker mercenaries and then mm -hmm. if you wanted to play mercenaries and have the full health or the full strength of the roster you have to play mercenaries specifically now when it comes to the visual design differences basically orca is kind of like designing half of a full nation so they are um a bit more difficult because they're more from from my perspective they're more difficult and more expensive not more expensive but they're they they require the same sort of attention that i have to apply to the republic now the republic has a bigger catalog but i want each of the sub factions to feel distinctly different so i'm trying to approach it and i i kind of admittedly kind of stumbled into parts of this and kind of started polishing it as i went um, it, it's, it's interesting because I guess like if I would have looked at this from the outside, you know, uh, two years ago and said, okay, you're going to design a, a, a faction of sub factions and they're all going to visually look different. So you have to approach them as if you're designing a primary nation, but they're all together. So right. Why wouldn't I just design multiple other primary nations then, and then come back to work a years later. It kind of just, it made sense for the location on the um, planetary maps where to kind of pick the next nation. Um, I wasn't really ready to go, you know, as far as looking at the map going north. Um, so you wanted nations that were next to the union to kind of pick from to begin with. So in this case, you're actually talking about the, the, the lore and the, 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 the where you wanted, how, how you wanted the universe to be shaped actually mm -hmm. influenced how you went about creating a faction. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, uh, a great example in terms of both visual design and game design is the Covenant from Halo. Because it took me actually a while and having to go read the backstory to understand that the Covenant was actually, uh, like you were mentioning, like a union of different factions. Mm-hmm. So, so the Grants were one nation, the Roots were another nation, and the Elites were another nation, and, and that sort of stuff. But uh, the artists actually found a cohesive visual direction to give all of them, like a common theme, so that uh, the, the first few Halos that I played, I, I didn't even know that there were a series of sub-factions. I, I just thought they were basically one single faction that had multiple races. And th that is a, a great example of how you can make all of them look different, but still give them a cohesive team. Because, I mean, a Grant and a Brute have nothing in common, except a few cues that, that you basically have the, co the Covenant aesthetics. So if you give a little bit of the Covenant aesthetics to each of, of the different designs, they start to become unified, particularly when, when you get into colors as well. And, and, sure. uh, and the major volumetric shapes, because the government, the government all have those like uh, more sleek, more rounded shapes. And, and then uh, they all always had 
that that unique look where the their armor was sort of reflective but also changing a little bit in color when they reflected and and had like the re reflective hexes as well so they managed to make them look uh different and yet uh cohesive which is a hard thing to do I, yeah, I would agree. But they Halo has the benefit that the very first Halo, Combat Evolve, right. really only had four factions when you look at the Flood and the Forerunners as well. Yeah. And basically anything that appeared alien was Covenant. And it was really easy to be like, they're all Covenant. Yeah. Um, and then I think they much more developed the lore as the, the other installments continued. Things became locked in with the release. Um but you are, you're right, they all have, they, they all do feel the same enough that you don't question it. You don't, you're not like, well, these are very different. Well, they're, they're Covenant of Aliens. Okay, sure. Yeah, but I mean, just look at them. If you take a, a Phantom, which is like that, that Covenant flyer, and you take the Ghost, which is that, that, that like a really cool, like small hover, hover bike thing. And, and you take the, the armor on the back of Grunts or the armor of the Elites. It all has the same shader with the same color, with the same reflectiveness and all that. And that really helps unify the entire thing. Even though the aliens themselves are all different sizes and different uh, uh, looks and all that. Right. But again, that, that is, for example, a, a materials and, and a color thing. So how, how, do you, how do you translate that? when you are actually talking about just uh, unpainted shapes. Okay, so the Covenant have like rounded platings and rounded shapes and more bulbous designs. Okay, that takes care of the volumetrics, so they all sort of look the same. Uh, they, they look cohesive. And then they all have carry around the, the same weaponry. So right. you put together all these different elements that, that make what is essentially like four or five different different looking factions feel like they are one single faction. And Halo did have the benefit of, of having like the, the, the Covenant were the enemies, right? And, and they made the wise decision with the Flood as well because the Flood weren't just zombies that, that almost looked like the regular people that were running around. They, they be, the, the flood actually looked a lot like, I don't know, plant monsters come to life, which made them look, again, really different from the rest. Even right. even, yeah. even though you also had different kinds of aliens and humans in uh, as flood forms. Yeah, and they had a very... Um, when, you, when you look at it from... Analyze it from a developer perspective, the fact that they created an entire third faction... That was just visually the corrupted versions of assets you already have. Yeah. Um, but you made the play style, their their interaction with the players, very different. So they entirely felt like an entire separate entity. They don't feel the same as anybody else. Um, it, it's a it's a very creative way to not have to go and design an entire third alien race. Uh, whether it was robots or something that was like, okay, that's that's their thing. Granted, the forerunners kind of fill the, the the robot side, but yeah. um, each felt very unique. You didn't feel like I'm fighting the exact same thing. Now, whether or not you felt like that as you kept playing the levels is one thing, but as far as yeah. visually, they were very very separate. Yeah, I mean, you had the the bungee trope of uh, okay, you you had the level now you're going from A to B, and the next level is going from B to A. <laughs> <laughs> the the library in in the first Halo is is a good example of that. Um, yeah, uh, and you you mentioned a, a very common trope in these sorts of games and and science fiction actually, which is to basically have like uh, reusing reusing assets or reusing the concepts and 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 have a new faction that is basically corrupted corrupted versions of of the factions you already have. And the ultimate example is of course zombies. What's it? Do you want to create a, an enemy for humans? Just just have zombies. They are zombie humans. Yeah. Um, and and they, they with this they, they actually took it a little a, a step further. And 
Mass Effect also ended up doing sort of the same with Mass Effect 3 when you, you started having all the different uh, aliens as husk versions. I don't know if you remember that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and and in, so in the third game you had uh, Turian husks and you had uh, Asari husks and, and they sort of started to look like uh, really different but still somewhat recognizable but they played entirely different from, from the regular aliens, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, it, it's um, obviously like we were mentioning earlier that how the lore kind of guides things, the lore for Revelations is the reason there's a game. Yeah, is that um, is that it? Uh, is is in your in your universe the lore is guiding your game? Is for, so I have two different approaches that kind of meet together on the same. Well, they become the same road. Right. So I began with the lore side because that was what I could afford to do. Mm -hmm. Um developing that and then wanting always wanting to have a miniatures game um but i recognize that there's going to be players or or customers we'll just go from that way yeah. that are only going to be interested in one of the two boxes they only want to play the game they 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 know enough of the lore to kind of understand why they're what the stakes are but they're still really primarily only there for the game and you have other people who are there that are only there for the lore. They might look at the game. They might not be in the miniatures. They might not want to paint. So they're only there because they like the story and the setting. And then you'll have others who consume as much as they can on both. And they kind of, you know, kind of meets together. So it gives them the why things are fighting, uh, why the nations are there, why they visually are the way they are kind of thing. And then, you know, because they're invested in the, the lore side. So with, with me, the lore of Revelations has to work together with the game i try extremely hard um you know okay for example i, I grew up we both played battletech a lot right battletech's novels were different than the game yeah not counting just the the sort of stat sheet you know <laughs> uh, uh lots of rules and all these other things um just the the way that weapons worked in the Battletech <clears throat> lore and the way that they work in the miniatures games that they developed are very different. They don't feel like they're really in the same place sometimes. Um, so I'm trying to do that with Revelations to make them feel very similar to the, like, if you read about something happening in, um, in the novels, I want the players to feel like they pretty much have access to do that. Like they feel that the weapons do the same pretty comparable amount of damage um you know that that yeah um the hero doesn't really feel like he has like extensive plot armor that if he's piloting <laughs> a spade for example and you're like okay i played the miniature game plenty of times spades aren't going to survive fighting you know eight goblins from the union they're at some point they're going to get worn down so i i try to make them feel like they're on the same ship together and i think that's easier because i'm the lead author and the lead game developer so I can make sure that they're married together very easily or at least with intention easily um, versus other lines that have people working in different areas and that may not kind of mesh. Right, right. Um, and and you're, you're particularly interested in, in uh, co maintaining cohesiveness and believability in your setting. So, so the fiction needs to feel like the game and the game needs to feel like the fiction. Right. Yeah. It's very important to me that they feel close enough that you, you know, I, I, I like the idea that, you know, someone could be reading the novels and be like, okay, there's a company of, of combined forces here. Maybe, you know, there's infantry and tanks and, and then they can kind of replicate that on the table. Right. And to kind of see, well, like if I was doing it, how would I have done it differently and how would it have turned out? Now, granted, there's environment conditions and other things happening in the stories. But, you know, to still kind of have a little bit of um, recreation that feels plausible to what happened in the lore that they can kind of do themselves and experience. So so in terms of, of recapping, your approach was, was uh, particularly due, due to... Both your your background and you you are an author and and you are a writer, and and in terms of cost effectiveness, you went in with a lore first approach, and the lore 
basically shapes the direction of your game. Uh, like you said, for example, in the way you designed the, the, the orc affection and, and the mercenaries, you are using the lore to, to shape the game, and then you want the game and the lore to feel like a co cohesive whole, even when people are reading about the action or they are actually playing the action. Exactly. And, you know, it helps in my opinion, to have, because mine is so lore focused that when we're designing a new model that we run it through the filters of one, does this feel like revelations? Right. And two, does it feel like it follows the same sort of rules that we've already sort of established for these other factions? Now, when we're doing a new nation like the Faust Union, um, we kind of start that over, but it's a much easier process for me because I've already done it three other times that now we're doing a fourth one i can the sort of design principles kind of just go in a circle but you still have to put them through those filters and sometimes um different concept artists or different modelers because they're so excited about their idea that they try to influence it and it it's not from a controlling i just want to do what i want rick but it's more of they're not yet as you know, I've been soaking in this for several years now. So for me, it's much easier to kind of hop back in like, but does this feel like the Republic? Of course. Yeah. You know, and they're still kind of new on the outside, depending on how many times they've worked with me. So they're still kind of gaining that um, that process of, OK, this is going to be Rick's way of analyzing and he's going to to poke at it until it it gets in the shape that he needs for whatever nation. And you have you have the uh, the artist's uh, ex expressiveness, right? And you have your outlook as as the 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 main creator and the person that knows the core of what Revelations is. But then you also have the the transmission of the ideas. Like, what does the what is the artist receiving? Because art is communication, right? I have like a thought or a feeling or an idea. I put it in, in an art piece and then someone that looks at that art will might and usually gets some ideas communicated back that might not exactly be 100% what the artist intended. So in this case, obviously the, your, the artists that you hire will have their own unique perspective on, on basically the stuff that, that they are looking at. And, and then as a game designer, you have to basically guide them towards exactly what you want to do with it. Um, yeah. in, in, in terms of Blackstar, my approach is, is, is actually very different. And then, again, this, this will be useful for the listeners because I'm an artist. And early on, I decided, you, you know... Um, I'm working on on lore and and Blackstar is is uh, the basis for Blackstar is is an old Portuguese epic poem where I'm taking specific characters and I'm taking a, a few situations and overall feel of it to to make Blackstar but I'm not a writer right as much as uh, not only does the day only have 24 hours and I can't do everything <laughs> at once <laughs> And you know the feeling, Rick, right? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I know my strong point isn't writing and it will never be writing. I can, I can learn the craft, I, I can improve, but, but uh, I'm an artist. So I'm going with a visuals-focused approach, an art-focused approach going into Blackstar. Obviously, uh, I think lore is important and the setting is important. That and, and I have the same concern that you have, that I want everything to feel believable and cohesive within each other. So I don't want to have like this guy in, in a mech in, in the lore is shooting down seven other mechs, but you can never do that in the game. You know, that, that heroic moments are okay, but l let's not exaggerate things like some of the stuff that, that, that is in other fiction. Um, but again, I'm, I'm concerned with, do the mechs look as awesome as they possibly can? Because I, I don't have anything else, right? I don't have infantry. I don't have tanks. I don't have, uh, aerospace fighters. I don't have like, um, 
hero units like Warhammer 40k does. Like you have, you can play with uh, like the Space Marine Captain something, and that guy is awesome and and he's he's as strong as 20 Space Marines or something. I don't have that. So, art focused approach. The game needs to be as good looking as possible to attract people because that's what uh, that's what I know best how to do. The max league need to look as awesome as possible and it doesn't matter basically how much it costs to design them or how long it takes to design them because it's it's a game entirely about max the max are the centerpiece and if i can make the max as awesome as possible to attract people uh, everything else will follow so i have to make sure both as an artist and as a creator of the game that the max look uh, are the best thing about the game and and the visuals are the best thing about the game um going in because that that's the eye candy sells and that's the first thing people see people uh, people don't feel the rules or, or they don't know how to play the game before they they actually learn to play it the first thing they see is the materials is the key art and and the max so being an artist, that's the approach I'm taking, right? I'm, I'm trying to make the, the entire visual side of the game as awesome as I possibly can and, and spending so far most of the money that I have spent on Blackstar has been towards art and designing the art and designing the mechs. Yeah, we, and... Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Go, go ahead. Um, the... And for me, I, you know, I, I don't consider <laughs> if you talk to me one on one or like right now, like I don't consider myself a some amazing author. I think where, where my strength as I've done this more and more is is in um, like creativity, being able to kind of envision a universe and then to kind of explain expanding upon that i don't feel like i've done anything that no one else can copy i'm not so amazing at this that you know if someone's listening and they want to develop their own game that they couldn't emulate or or, or achieve what i've achieved that you know i don't have almost any artistic abilities in terms of of illustrations or concept art um i'm barely good enough to paint uh so i've had to work at things so i you know the when we go into the design process for a new unit sometimes depending on how many other tasks i'm kind of juggling behind the scenes whether in my personal life or business um it it's easier or it's more difficult or if it's the type of design like we have one mech that we're working on that is a mix of passion project and a mix of you know this needs to be the coolest thing that this faction has so it's it goes through a much stricter process and there's a lot more notes as opposed to some designs um, that kind of flow really easily. They just kind of just work and it just, it just depends on the individual design and what it, and what I'm trying to accomplish with it. So it, it, the lore guides it. The lore was what I could work on. So that's, that's, you know, the most important plus to me, I love watching, you know, action scenes that, you know, growing up, all, some of the more uh, exciting Gundam uh, fights were always really cool as a kid or, or different animations that you saw or like opening animations, the cinematics for uh, like Mech Warrior 4 is right. phenomenal, in my opinion. It still is phenomenal. I don't care haters out there, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the um, you, you know, just the... I guess that that side of things would be really cool to get into at some point. But yeah, yeah, the, yeah. I, I'm partial. Uh, I'm partial to the MechWarrior Two uh, cinematics because that was like the first MechWarrior game that I played. Okay, yeah, my first one was MechWarrior Three, but there was something about Four. I don't. know. It's just the music working together with the, uh, the acting and the animation just connected different. I guess an emotional level in yeah, a yeah. good way. So I just like stuck on it. Like that is awesome. <laughs> Right. Um, I mean, uh, we each, uh, everyone, you're saying that you don't think you're, you're like the, this great author or, or, or all that and, and the ideas could be done by other people. But 
our our strength is our is our voice everyone uh, i usually say there's a lot of discussions particularly with visual art right that oh um this mech or this tank or this superhero looks like that other superhero then you copied something or or, or or basically everything has been invented everything has been done already what you have is 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 a unique voice that maybe the slight differences that your your unique voice can give to this same material will be the difference between the material being good and and being just average or the difference between the material being super popular and just being popular even in both cases being good right so first of all as an artist don't 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 sell yourself short right and second of all um Again, that, that that particular voice is what will make people stand out, right? Of course, you have like you have to really put the work into it, and some people are uh, have great ideas and then are lazy. But I can tell you, for example, the, the in terms of the backstory of Revelations, you've managed to 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 give it a spin and an angle and and a quality that that, for example, I thought. Um, other universes that were tackling the same sub subject completely failed in, in doing. And a specific example that comes to mind is actually Mass Effect 3, you know, and, and the endings and all that. Uh, <laughs> I'm very upset with Mass Effect 3's ending still. <laughs> yeah, I can I see that. Cheated. <laughs> I can see that. And, and I always bring up Mass Effect because it's my, it's, it's, the first game blew me away and I think people underestimate the importance when people say oh I love this game or this game is a great game and and what do you think of the game is always colored by the what was going on in your life in that particular moment in time and how you were feeling in that particular moment in time and even your maturity level your age at that particular moment so for me mass effect one hit all the marks at the time where my life was receptive to 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 basically live in that game world i was blown away by mass effect one even though of course i i totally understood that mechanically like the fir the third person shooting was a bit crap and all that and the end <laughs> don't get me started on the <laughs> on the planetary exploration on the mako <laughs> <laughs> climbing like climbing like almost vertical spike mountains in planets to reach certain locations <laughs> but the game in terms of the quality of the writing and 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 at the time the cutscenes and the acting was so incredible at that particular moment in my life with all the stuff that i, I had going on in my life that it instantly became my favorite universe and franchise. So when I think of, <laughs> of like, um, failing to find that that particular voice and failing to find that that solution to that same material that a lot of other authors have have uh, tackled, Mass Effect Three is the one that comes to mind because there was such a build up to that game and and then the ending, and then the ending. <laughs> <laughs> the ending could be like a, a four. We could talk for like for a four-hour podcast on, on the ending, which of course is what I mean. There, there are like uh, hundreds of thousands of hours on YouTube and social media of people complaining about the, the ending of Mass Effect Three, right? Yeah, or trying to talk about how amazing it is, and they're just wrong. Uh, right, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so, so. We, we have like completely like uh, different approach, approaches to, to our games, even though uh, they're games that have max in, in my case, and that's actually another different approach. I am doing a, a Mac game and and your game, how do how would you classify your game, Rick? Is it, is it would you say your revelation skirmish is a Mac game? No. No, I would say it's a combined arms game. Right. So it, it was purposely designed from the ground up that infantry and tanks 
or just vehicles in general will be very, very lethal. Um, so there's not, you don't feel like it's a mech game that tacked on infantry and tanks. Which, it, those, which is what a lot three, of them do. Right. All three were in there at the exact same time I was developing. And the yeah. consideration was like, okay, because so, I started with the Republic first to design them to balance the game. So I looked at the Marines, the Mars main battle tank, and then the Sierra. Those were the first three units. They were each for their own unit class. And I'm like, okay, the infantry have to be able to hurt mechs. Okay, so every infantry unit has to be at least equipped with a laser rifle that was strong enough to at least do a single point of damage to a mech. So at least they all could do something to each other. And then kind of just evolve from there to... to um, power armor and some other things but you know that that was 100 percent part of the classification i know there's some people who look at revelations and are like it's a mech universe and i'm like no it's a universe with mechs but the mechs are not king the mechs if you're if you know if you're a pilot that just walks in um and doesn't really pay it like if as a player i've told people like if you the standard game is up to 12 units per side um and you get points to be able to build your list if you take half, like if you take only war mechs against a combined arms list, that's the same points. Your mechs, obviously, the number of units you have to activate will be significantly less because the mechs are more expensive. The combined arms player should absolutely dominate the mechs only guy. And it's not because mechs are weak. It's just because the cohesion that you can have with the combined arms is just different than mechs only. Right. And how they work together. You know, there's just when you're surrounded by infantry and vehicles that can all just simultaneously pepper a mech to death, you can only kill so many of those smaller units fast enough from the mech's perspective to kind of keep up. I, I think there's there's a bit of a cliche where people see, oh, that this the setting has mech, so it's automatically a mech setting, which isn't the case at all. I mean, uh, I would never describe, for example, Star Wars as being a mech game or a mech universe. It has walkers, no, no. but yeah. <laughs> they are far from being like the the thing that makes the universe. Yeah, and I I know that when I was developing a lot of the you know because you have to do something to promote your product, so I leaned into especially earlier on artwork that featured war mechs, and well why because that's the eye candy you know if, right. if it's just the you know. I guess it would be impressive if you saw like a hundred thousand Marines rushing something in an image like that would be cool, but it looks a little bit cooler if there's war mechs involved, but then your eye gets sucked to the war mechs because they're so big and imposing that you, that I think sometimes it probably sends the wrong message. And that's partly my fault. I, I you only have so much budget to do illustrations and promotions with. So you have to kind of pick and choose what will pull people in. And I get comments periodically where someone's like i i like the fact that you made it combined arms now black star is different because it's more of a a like you were saying like an arena style game so that one there's no harm in it being only max and it actually makes more sense that it's mech focused because you're just not going to have a squad of guys fighting a mech in an arena like it's 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 it would be a mess. <laughs> that 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 actually presented me with a challenge, right? So so it's it's max only because, uh, not only because uh, first I wanted to do like a Mac only game. Second, um, taking inspiration from the from the old Portuguese history and and the European medieval history, um, this is taking inspiration from those jousting tournaments, you know, where a knight starts in on one end of the field and another knight on the other end, and then they they run and try to basically, like, uh, slam each other with with like a spear and stuff like that, you know, jousting, and and they had other side types of competitions in medieval times, but that that's right. basically where where this is coming from. So, obviously. I don't want to have a squad of battle armors fighting a mech in a mech tournament, but there, there, I have been tackling this this design challenge for a, for a long time, and and you've you've seen how I've been like changing things and going back and forth, where some mechs and and the inspiration for some of the mechs are actually like some mechs are fifteen meters tall, and then but a lot of mechs I'm finding are actually 
in the five meter, six meter, seven meter tall range. And, and that would make it really weird. Visually, you would have some mini some miniatures that are twice as tall as the others. That that's for some people that's not a negative, but uh, it might look weird to other people. But in terms of believability, it 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 sort of is a bit strange. How, how can I justify that this this miniature that is half the size of the other is actually as powerful or even more powerful than the other mech that is just like gigantic and then and then i didn't want to have okay this is still max but it's a squad of since these max are weaker quote unquote i'm not casting aspersions on anything um i have a squad of these three max against that bigger mech but again that sort of defeats the purpose of, of a mech tournament where uh, inspired by the old times where a knight goes up against another knight for the virtue of the kingdom and his house or to win the hand of the lady or something like that, you know. So I also didn't want to do that. So that left me with the challenge of uh, both the scale of the miniatures and how uh, and game balancing and and the approach that I'm taking is that I upped the scale of the game to uh, initially it was 15 millimeter and now it's going to be 25 millimeter so it went from uh, in terms of of uh, European terms 1 100 and now it's 172 scale but it's still a, there's still a little bit of flexibility there where I, I can maybe okay I'm gonna give this mech one centimeter uh, more of height and the other one I'm I'm gonna keep at the at the height that it's supposed to be so the differences aren't as extreme so um, they will still have differences in sizes but I'm trying to approximate them so it doesn't feel weird on the other hand I'm uh, true the pilot cards and through the deck of, of uh, action cards I'm going to give uh, some of the max abilities to some to somewhat compensate abilities and moments and actions to somewhat compensate if they are on paper quote unquote less powerful you know so but th that's actually been a challenge in terms of thinking about how the game should uh, not just game mechanics but how it should look right because um, the way the miniatures are presented in the game uh, makes a huge difference and I didn't want uh, I knew I wanted big detailed mech miniatures but at a certain point if if some of them start being smaller and smaller then I have to change something and how do I handle that change in relation to the others that were at the height that I wanted and X-Wing also does a little bit of this because uh, not not all the ships are at the same scale actually and I only re realized that when because I, I don't have like the Star Wars ship sizes memorized of course I only <laughs> I only realized that because there's a site that that uh, has that listing you know like uh, next wing is one uh, one 270 scale but then another ship is uh, 225 scale and and back and forth you know and and they sort of vary some of them are still bigger than others because that's how they are supposed to be but they, they kind of try to bring things closer and also the base sizes even though i don't have a grid or hexes or anything like that but base sizes are, are also a good way to to transmit that so to speak yeah and yeah and 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 then the the final thing which I I think we didn't tackle uh, it would actually be more relevant for revelations, is that do you, do do you actually feel like in an army game in in a combined arms game in in action and in terms of believability of the of the lore, um, it does it make sense to have a twenty five meter tall mech? No. Right, and then <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. Well, and and uh, you know when I when I sat down and I was like, okay, well, how do I want Revelations Mechs to be? And this was across several years of kind of revisiting the topic um, before I got really super serious about it. And 
I finally, you know, I was doing research on and off where people are like, yeah, mechs are just completely unrealistic. I disagree. Right. But they're, you know, they're completely, they're, they'll never work. They'll never under, you know, not, not you know, all this negative uh, view. And I was like, okay, well, what would make it mostly believable? Well, mechs won't work in all environments. Well, why not? Well, because if everything's flat, you can see them. <coughs> Anything that has a lower profile can has a much greater likelihood of, of hitting them before they're getting hit back. So if you do enough of the hitting, you've destroyed whatever you were shooting at before they've destroyed you. So vehicles like tanks that have a much lower profile in a big open flat area have a much better time than a 18 story machine stomping through the middle of nowhere. Right. Um, so, and, and I wanted my max to feel more believable where you know they um are agile enough to do what they need to do so that but they carry enough firepower to be a threat to everything um and actually sometimes tanks actually have heavier weapons depending on the um the faction um because the tanks can distribute the weight differently now i'm not I'm nowhere near an engineer or a or a physicist but i try to apply an aspect of realism when we're making a new design um and we, I, I, I ended up settling on most mechs being between two and three stories. Um, right. We have some that go over, but the basically, like we're working on one mech that's going to be like 40 feet tall in universe. And the reason that I'm doing that is because that faction recognizes that that mech is there for more of an intimidation factor. Right, and right. they wouldn't deploy it in a setting where there's a lot of air cover or something that could destroy it. They, they're going to do, they're going to deploy it when they feel they have a better chance of winning. So it's more of an intimidation. Okay. Now that big guy is here. He's big and scary looking, it, you know, it sends that fear factor through the enemy, but you know, um, and realizing that lore wise aircraft are super deadly. Yeah. So you have to be careful of how you deploy your mechs. So really the mechs are, used in scenarios where they're most effective and recognizing that if you're playing revelations um there is a much larger war going on there's a much larger battle you're playing a section of that battle so you're not fighting necessarily the artillery or the aircraft other guys are outside of your exact battles you know battlefield so those elements are there they're off table but they're there so it, it's kind of like being mindful that there's all these other assets for both sides um even if you don't see them yeah man and you just and you just mentioned another aspect that, again that is congruent to the entire approach that you are taking with your universe and your game which is the reason for the design of that specific mech is 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 lore based it comes from the lore and and the game follows right and and, and i think yeah. it'll be a cool model but yeah yeah, yeah the, the lore the, the in-universe explanation applies why is this mech so much bigger than some of the others. I, I think there, there's a big... I'm, I'm not a big military buff guy or anything like that, you know. Um, but I, I think there's a misconception that a lot of people think... Uh, uh, that there's the crowd that thinks Max wouldn't be feasible and then there's the crowd that like, oh, it's the king of the battlefield and, and, and mm -hmm. Battletech even sells itself on that premise. But the truth is... Um, the truth is the, the hidden truth that nobody <laughs> really wants to talk about is that vehicles are, are really good in Battletech as well, you know, and MX really aren't that much of kings of the battlefield, but that, that that's another subject. But <laughs> just like every, just like any military equipment, they have their specifications and, and their purposes. Right. They aren't like useful in every single possible situation. If, even a machine gun isn't as useful in, in if you are in close quarters. That, that that's why they have pistols. That was that's why they have like uh, submachine guns and stuff like that. You're not going to like a, people who see in these movies. So sometimes these guys in uh, going to houses with like a sniper rifle. And <laughs> trying to sweep the house with the sniper rifle, and, and and if the the guy has a pistol, you're dead, basically. Um, but because you don't have like the time or the stability to get 
to get off a proper shot with the sniper rifle in, in like when you're walking down the corridor trying to cover doors and stuff like that. So no one is saying that like the mech should be like dominating the battlefield in an open in an open plains kind kind of scenario. No, mechs can be awesome in specific scenarios where you have like dense urban environments and you need more maneuverability or uh, and tanks are limited on going in in uh, like roads uh, or or a jungle where where uh, mechs can aren't really as dependent on having like flat flat ground where they they can like a vehicle where they can walk um and then the other thing is that in terms of uh, our design philosophy I, I will have mechs that are slower uh, and less agile some are fast and more agile but the reality is uh, a mech kind of only makes sense if it's somewhat agile and somewhat fast be precisely because it's more useful in those types of scenarios where he can maneuver where vehicles can't. So the whole, this mech is super big and super slow and super tall. That thing will, will get killed really, really fast unless you are doing it, like you said, for example, for effect. It's an intimidation, it's a psychological factor. But if you're going with a 25 meter tall, super slow, not not agile at all mech in an open field against like a tank, the tank will win. Yeah, or or at least the comparable firepower yeah. combination of if if it took four tanks to equal one mech, those four tanks are going to have a much easier time destroying yep. that one mech in an open field than the mech will, vice versa. Unless it has plot armor or some sort of super weapons that that the tanks just don't compare right um, right but like when i designed the the mechs we one of the things that was fundamental from the beginning was that each mech has um and some of these i think we've been more successful because i've we've grown as a company but that each mech has consideration for joints for <clears throat> um the way that the the hips move the way that the knees are there's no exposed pistons or gears or cogs or anything where it looks like somebody with a frag grenade could just come by and just toss it in there or a C4 charge or something equivalent. <laughs> Someone just totally disable your mech without any sort of complication. Someone with a pocket knife. Right. Like, you know, and, and I kind of run through the idea of um, like the Ewoks in Star Wars. Like, how oh, about, yeah. You know, like, there, was, there was plot armor, but at the end of the day, the Ewoks should never have been able to disable ATSTs. Like nobody was paying attention apparently that all these traps were just all over the place. But and even go beyond that in Empire Strikes Back again the example since you had a lot of mechanics and technical details exposed on the walkers, Luke could right. just go behind below the walker with a lightsaber, cut a few cables or whatever he did there, and the the entire walker goes down. Well, right. I mean, with the lightsaber, it wouldn't be hard with those, um, the AT-ATs to just, uh, <laughs> I, ref I will not say at-at. I refuse. You're wrong. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, you literally take out one foot, which he could do pretty easily with just literally cutting half of it, just the back half, and the foot will eventually fail and the whole machine would fall. Yeah. And that's, and they had no anti-infantry response. It was nothing pointed underneath the machine to, to shoot at any infantry that got near the legs uh, so like with revelations we do every joint is is covered with some sort of material whether that's something that when you look at the model it appears hard or it's like an accordion sort of uh or a mesh or something is covering those joints so that it's more difficult for infantry to deal with disabling because you know i i i would recognize that if you're a mech and you're walking through an urban environment which is maybe an environment where mechs can excel uh, especially if they're jump capable to, to maneuver and position themselves um, easier. You're at risk of infantry. You know, you get too close to enemy infantry and two guys run out with something to disable your, your foot. Well, that <laughs> makes a bad time now with, yeah. a, with a broken foot. So again, it's kind of remaining mindful of those elements. A pocket knife. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and... Uh... That, that's actually good that we had this conversation because uh, I'll be like uh, remaking the model for the Sierra for Blackstar and I didn't know 
that particular like a uh, technical aspect so oh yeah gotcha yeah, that's the yeah because <laughs> we while there are some infantry models in the game that have um, explosive charges which are purposely designed to disable a mech they have to be really close obviously to be able to right. use that but right, visually right. still the machines are um relatively protected you know there only can be so much in a in a in a joint cover for protection but at least it stops small arms fire it stops shrapnel or debris from whatever else is happening around them from getting in there and jamming your arm up right right it's it's a, it's a machine built to, in, to to be resistant in 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 all aspects against basically sort of all aspects so so there there are not any glaring weak spots like uh like oh uh, the the mech has a, a small hole there where I, where I can shoot a photon torpedo and blow up the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I try not to have any like we we've had sometimes because modelers are used to a certain visual, so they're like, well, let's put in this big vent on the back, and I'm like, well, that that's a big weak spot now from behind the machine. Now they might be designed that way because of the the way that the nation's tech level or their mech research level, you know, there there might be a reason. Yeah. why they have a glaring weakness but you have to ask the question is there this big vent is a spot that is now weak anything that can shoot directly in there so now we have to do we say stats wise there's weak spot um in the back uh, yeah or if, is it just yeah. you know you just ignore that well i can't ignore it because it's 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 a big hole basically so so from a design perspective you what you're talking about is you're thinking about all those sorts of aspects. It's not just rule of cool. And if for some reason there are those elements, they need to be reflected both in the lore and in the game. Like uh, it's it's on this max specifically or this unit specifically has a weak spot there. And there should be a rule or, or, or a consequence in the game that reflects that. Right. Instead of just oh no, it has like a gigantic hole on the back, but nothing happens. Yeah, it goes nowhere. Right. It's like, well, there's a vent. There's a hole. <laughs> it's not that much armor. Um, I, I think the logic yeah. from, particularly from an artist side, from an art side, I think the logic for most artists is that it's having the the hydraulics and and all that stuff showing makes it more visually interesting. I think that that that's basically it. Um, I don't know. Some people might not be actually thinking that it's a weak spot, right? I think they're just trying to make it visually interesting and varied, and oh, yeah. th and they aren't thinking that yeah, that would be a weak spot and it should be protected. Because some of the designs that you see around around the web and not just Max in in general in all sorts of vehicles and stuff are like oh, I, I can just I, I can just like. Uh, shoot a slingshot at that part and the entire thing blows up. Yeah, and I think um, I think that's that's it. I mean, like, Star Wars obviously influences a lot of, even if you hate Star Wars, oh, you yeah. have to recognize that visually it affected a lot of things. It changed and everything. Star, right, and Star Wars had a lot of exposed tubes and, and panels and all kinds of stuff where you're like, okay... The, it's cool looking as a as a viewer, but you know I don't want anything where someone looks at a mech and like a hammer could break it. No, look, then, that, that oh, one... now all the you know hydraulic fluids leaking, so now that's it. That is <laughs> one of the most popular like spaceships in 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 fiction in in any fiction is the Millennium, Millennium Falcon, right? And yeah. and that, that thing is entirely exposed everywhere. Yes, it's it's surviving by plot alone. Yeah, it's surviving by plot uh, plot alone and and some uh, flex tape. <laughs> <laughs> but I have found that uh, um, most modelers or concept artists are willing to when I when I question things they're like, oh yeah, I guess you're right, and then they'll change it. But I I do run into that quite a bit where people are used to like you said, it's visually appealing to have lots of gribbly bits. Yeah. Um, but when you just stop and say, okay, so a, you've designed this leg where, where where a guy with a rifle, laser rifle, is going to 
hit this. Like I, I, I don't, I, I try to word it in a nice way of just like, that's, that's a weak spot. Like we just don't do gears. We don't do cogs. We don't anything, but <laughs> that's uh, good to know. <laughs> that's <laughs> good to know. <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of people are used to that. Yeah. Yeah. I am used to that actually. And, and since we, we had sort of, uh, we're giving people some glimpse on the behind the scenes again. But since we had sort of talk uh, about uh, like the more uh, Spartan utilitarian looks that Titanfall and Star Wars have in some of the units would be like an inspiration for making a higher detailed Sierra. I wasn't actually aware that I'm also supposed to not have a lot of gribbly details and, and uh, hydraulics on show. But the, again, it's, it's it's good to know. But it, it's it, it's a, a visual visual variety thing, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Some people also think that joints with the whole, uh, like with the whole thing covered. I don't know how you call it in English, but it basically looks like a like a like a some sort of material rubbery material around the joints, and it sort of looks like someone something that folds, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, some people think that looks weird, but that's actually much more mecha mechanically accurate to have that sort of protection on those components. Imagine if you have to fight underwater or, or in a particularly dusty se setting and then you get some like some rocks or some dust that jams the hydraulics. They know they, they actually need, need to be protected. Right. And, you know, it, it's easy to say... My, you know, Revelations War Max are War Max because they're designed for war. But uh, you have to think of all the little things that end up adding up to how does this machine survive? How do they keep it functioning? How does it go from mission to mission and needing service? But I mean, it's still in the fight. And to me, like joints are are a thing that a lot of people in my and, and it depends on their universe. Yeah. For revelations, joints have to be considered at all times. And it, even getting into a, a functional thing, you know, the mech has to look like it can uh, squat because not all are quite as agile or, or maneuverable as others. But I mean, there has to be consideration for how does the ankle move? And some of this has had to e uh, creatively evolve for right. me and, and, and expand and the questions I have or the, the conversations I have with modelers and concept artists are now different than what they were when I first started. And like when I first started with the Sierra and with others, that wasn't on my mind. I was more trying to just get the idea out and on paper, not considering some of the same things that I do now. And I think even in five years from now, things will look even more different or, or the processes will be more refined to like, these are, the 10 things every modeler has to keep in mind every time they're, you know, kind of thing so that there's more of a, of a uh, systematic approach to everything. Right. Right. Um, and, and again, this shows the difference, um, how, how, what you want the game to be influences, uh, should influence the design of the unit. So in, in your case, a lore focused approach, it's a combined arms game. And and the mechs are just uh, one element of the battlefield, and you want to have like this this uh, believability of function over form somewhat. Um, for Black Star, I'll, I will have all sorts of different mechs. Some of them will have exposed stuff, um, particularly because it's it's a mech tournament, and some of them will be configured and and sort of visually distinct from what you would say a, a battlefield military unit would be so mm -hmm. yeah i've actually talked about this distinction some of the concept art that i have presented for black star is sort of the military version of the unit and the actual version that that you will see that you will be able to play in battle in in black star will be like more blinged out and will have different components and will have like a, a more tournament look basically um if you want you you will be able to play with like the function over form version a military version of the mech because you will have customization and you can switch parts parts around 
but I'm making sure that that the Macs also have like this more flashy. That's the word I was looking for. More flashy uh, tournament look that has uh, like more flair because. This is like a sci-fi version of American Gladiators or wrestling or something, you know, but, but with Max. It's a Mac tournament, Let, let's make it... So, so basically I'm approaching again from a visual standpoint, a rule of cool uh, standpoint, you know, and not so much like the functional aspect of it. Yeah, and there's, there's zero wrong with it because it's just the way that it's, it's being approached. And right. W- what what I find is the most important is once someone figures out whatever their rules are, what it doesn't matter what they are, they they get to pick. They're the creator, the developer, the team that's working on it. I whatever they choose is what they choose that you that you stick with it. And then sometimes you see things kind of hop and you're like, "Eh, that doesn't fit now because you've already established this is our rule. This is our design approach. And then when you change it now, granted, Black Star is different because you're going to be able to take stuff from all over the place. Like you have a freedom that almost no other universe can use because purposely it's designed to to celebrate the different styles that are out there. Yeah, um, and not just from and the franchises that inspired them, but also artists and, and the featured guests from other games, you know. So yeah, everything will will be it's its own approach basically right so your your rule is we're celebrating all of these you know so that's the rule so there really there isn't anything that you can necessarily break if i all of a sudden start doing gundam styled (laughs) units i have broken the pre-established rules and now you know i have to have a really really good in-universe explanation for why we've gone so far off the mark Right, right, and uh, that's something that a lot of uni- fiction suffers from. Is that uh, at some point maybe it's because of overexposure, or maybe it's because it's been around too long, and they don't know what else to do with it. So now we're gonna insert. Oh, look, this this super enemy that is invincible and is totally different and breaks all the physics rules and all the rules that we have uh, had ex- established previously um, because we don't know how to do anything else with it so you have to be careful about that um, for black star i'm basically like uh, and anything goes it just has to make internal sense right which is that that works yeah, it's it's uh, as long as you're congruent and cohesive about your your idea, both approaches can totally work. You just need to to be like to have that vision, that clear vision, and and maintain that clear vision when you are designing your max and and your game really. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so so I, I think we covered a lot of ground in terms of mech design and and going into like some of the game design elements as well. Um, I, I have one last question here that someone asks. <laughs> is like, Rick, do you have uh, any particular uh, opinion on the amount of legs Max should have? <laughs> uh, at least two. <laughs> but that's not always a rule because we have a Mac. We have only one right now. That is, you know, uh, the equivalent of a, of a tank Mac. So it has treads for legs. Right. Um, it's basically... The lower half of it is a, um, a, a a very large tank sort of style platform, and then it has the you know the upper torso of a of a mech. Um, so it's a that one. <laughs> Go ahead. It's a mech on a wheelchair, basically. Uh, I mean that is one way you could describe it. <laughs> it's, it's it's actually one of the more distinctive mechs that has gotten compliments from people and it's for orca and it's one of the ones that people are like are you going to do more like this and i i didn't sit down and say okay this faction is going to be known for having their tank mechs um but it's something that people are like i haven't seen anything like this in other universes which surprises me because i've i've seen some um but tank mechs are definitely not normal it's, they're, they're yeah. more on the fringe yeah it, it's because of that they are more on the fringe for example uh, i've played the armored core games and and those types of mechs exist in the armored core universe but if you check most of the marketing materials for all those games it's always like bipeds yeah so we are 
we're we're working on I have right now one one quad mech um and we're exploring another one but we're actually having this conversation right now of which is better is it four or six legs yeah um, and my my thing i don't think <laughs> six legs that was my <laughs> i was like i remember painting my quad and i'm like eh. but so, <laughs> so you're, to you're talking about leg techs yeah yeah well the, the number of legs so yeah 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 it's it's I, the, I, there's there's a leg text there there's a leg text. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's... I can see the benefit potentially of a machine that has six. It's Because the reason that we even have the quad mech, it's meant to be a mobile railgun, essentially. So it's meant right. to be something that shoots down um, invading craft that that have already broken atmosphere. So it's it's basically a, a long-range sniper. And, and so needs to be more stable. Yeah. Right. But... Potentially, six legs is better. Now, when we first designed it, I thought four. There was no question from that original modeler. Um, so now we're actually kind of looking at going back and updating it because it doesn't visually fit with the rest of the Union of Stars. And that wasn't on purpose. It was just because where it fell in the development process that it kind of it kind of feels outside of their visuals. So I'm, I'm investigating the idea of spending the time and money to to re-skin it essentially right and, um because there hasn't really been anything it hasn't been in any novels or short stories there hasn't been um to my knowledge i, I don't think i put it in anything yet so it's it's able to be changed because while it's been out there and people might recognize it it's not been out there so much that we've established it's got four legs and i can't touch it so I have to go back and update all kinds of things. It was just the picture, you know, the, the person that took that picture, picture of the battlefield, you know, it, it's an optical illusion. It's the angle. It, it, it's, it's, all, <laughs> it's always had six legs. Don't, don't think about it. <laughs> always, always the, has. What are you talking about? These are, not, these are not the legs you are looking for. <laughs> Start getting the Man Mandela effect. What do you mean? There was always six. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm a six leg kind of guy. It's either a biped or six legs. And and uh, I I've been I, I sort of have like a block out for a six legged mech uh, that originally was supposed to be done for Patreon that I, I I've never gone back to you know and um, I will eventually go go back to do that six legged mech. Um, funnily enough, I don't like quad mechs, but I like six legged mechs. Uh, that's I, weird. Yeah, that's weird, and I can't tell you <laughs> I can't tell you why. I have no idea. I've thought about it like, what's the turn off with four legs? And I'm like, no, six just looks way, way cooler. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, six, for the Union, six will work because I tried to, like a lot of their visuals, I described them as being more aquatic looking. So mm -hmm. honestly, what kind of won me over to the idea one of the, the artists were suggesting, well, like it fits more with that theme of aquatic is six as a put like four doesn't make sense there's no you know in, most in, underwater creatures are going to have six so you know what depending on what they are you know what would really work well with the aquatic theme is that the, the mech is like a uh, um, a metal ball right and it's legs all around so it has like 36 legs it's like a ball of legs <laughs> I'm not. I'm not ready to go to that. <laughs> no, that's so much painting. <laughs> that that's not like tax. Uh, you know, I I really, I, uh, painting this mech professionally is is like twenty five dollars. Painting this thirty six leg mech is like five hundred dollars. <laughs> just, just because of all the legs. <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 been the only design where the the idea of painting it teared me away or at least it like pulled at my <laughs> creativity before that was never a thing and this this is like no 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 <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i think the the one conclusion that we can take from today's episode is that there is a leg tax on max and people might get tired of assembling and painting more legs so 
what is the sweet spot in terms of legs um, comment down below and tell us what you think how many legs are too many legs um, and that will surely uh, <laughs> go into effect in both our games I say <laughs> I'm gonna make an action card talking about legs <laughs> um, and be on the lookout for that uh, special edition uh, 36 leg mech coming out on April 1. For sure. Yeah, for, for Black Star, for sure. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th do you have anything else that, that you'd like to talk about, Rick? I don't think so. I mean, I think it, it's, you know, like we said at the beginning, everyone approaches this from a different perspective. There's no necessarily right or wrong approach. You just whatever the rules are for your realm and you kind of just, you know, stay in that box. Yeah. Be, be consistent with, with the vision that you have for your game. And if, if that vision translates across the rules and the setting and, and all your units, then uh, any approach can really work. That there, there isn't like a right way to do it. And I think yeah. that that's about it. Right. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's that's all for for this episode, everyone. Um, as usual, if if we don't have like a theme, uh, a main subject for for next week's episode, we will ask on Discord a few days earlier. Um, and again, a new episode next week, same bad time, same bad channel. Um, and we'll see you all then. Uh, take care, everyone. Bye, guys.